Hey, welcome to your lesson on DNA, genes, and chromosomes. The outcome for today is hopefully at the end of this, you can describe in general terms the role and relationship of chromosomes, genes, and DNA, how it all kind of comes together and relates. So that's what we're getting to in this uh, lesson. So first of all, what is DNA? Well, DNA is actually a shorthand for deoxyribonucleic acid. And it's the way that heredity happens in all plant and animal cells. So remember that heredity is the passing on of traits from one generation to the next. So let's actually start off right away with a nice little YouTube video on what DNA is. So the history of how DNA was discovered back early in the 1950s, Rosalind Franklin used x-ray photography to analyze the structure of DNA. From images that she came up with, she was able to conclude that DNA has a helical structure with two regularly repeating patterns. So this is actually a picture of that x-ray photography. And from this, uh, the structure of DNA was actually kind of determined. Now, I know it's really hard to interpret what's going on here, but right in the middle, that empty spot right there, that is what it is. It's an empty spot right there. And we've got this kind of like staircase, twisted ladder thing happening, going around in a circle over and over and over again. Uh, and it has essentially two regular repeating patterns that you're going to see. In 1953, Watson and Crick published a two-page paper describing this double helix model. So they did a bunch of calculations and stuff and modeling and basically figured out what the structure of DNA was based on this x-ray photography. And here it is. Here's kind of a picture of what DNA is made of. And then there's another picture coming up as well that shows a little bit more of the structure. So essentially what we have is kind of like a ladder where the handrails of the ladder. So what I mean by that is these side portions right here. Those are the handrails are made out of sugar and something called phosphate. Phosphate is phosphorus and oxygen kind of bonded together. Um, so sugar and phosphate make up the handrail portion, the sides of DNA. Okay, and then we have in the middle, the actual rungs of the ladder that hands and feet would go on and so on. That actually is uh, nitrogen bases. So it has nitrogen in it. And you're gonna learn later on kind of what bases are uh, in terms of acids and bases and how those two things relate. Anyways, they pair up in kind of a specific way. So C always goes with G and A always goes with T. So essentially these handrails are either gonna be a C and a G or an A and a T always. Now they can be flipped, right? Like here we see A and T, then here it's T A, here it's G C, here it's C G. Um, but always the rungs of our ladder are made up of these pairs of nitrogen bases. So structure, sugar and phosphate on the side, and then in the middle, the rungs, I have pairs of AT or CG. So what does that stand for? Well, A and T is called adenine and thymine, and these are the names of the nitrogen bases, and then C and G is cytosine and guanine. So if we were to show how this pairs up, let's say that we had an adenine over here, right? Then the only thing that could actually go with an adenine is the thymine and the shape is meant to show the fact that it can only go one way right if i've got an adenine it's got to go with a thymine because it fits together now it's not like it shows here in real life it's not that it fits together with a like a triangle type thing um, but instead it actually has to do with the chemical interactions between the nitrogen bases and something called hydrogen bonds that actually makes this happen that pairs them up uh, but at the end of the day they do just fit together only in the pair which makes the building of dna to be like this um automated process because as soon as we have a cytosine over here well then a guanine will go ahead and just kind of snap in based on the attraction and interaction between those two things. If I had a thymine, that would pair up with an adenine. And if I had a, ooh, what are we missing, a guanine, well, that would pair up with a cytosine. So when I'm building DNA, it always ends up being just these pairs of nitrogen bases over and over and over again. They just end up pairing up in order to actually make the genetic code. 
So, so here's a picture of the structure of DNA. And this ad diagram actually does a much better job of kind of showing the arrangement of what it looks like. So we have the sugar phosphate handrails on the side that twist around. So uh, this is hard to imagine, but it kind of twists two different ways. Okay, so if I were to take something like a ribbon or let's say a, uh, maybe what's better is a rope ladder, right? And then I twist it like this, then it ends up getting kind of a spiral twist thing going in it. But then also on top of that, it's twisting around kind of a center, almost like a dowel. So it's like a twisty ladder going around kind of this center portion. And you can kind of see that in this diagram here, that if I stuck a rod right down the middle here, right? It would actually just kind of work. There would be empty space right in the middle of that DNA structure. So that's how DNA works. And we call this a double helix structure. Now, if we take a look at a portion of the code of DNA of the nitrogen bases, adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine, if we take a look at a section, then that makes up something that we called a gene. A gene is a section of DNA made up of a specific set of bases and a certain order and what that gene does is it's basically the instructions or the recipe for making a protein and protein is a type of molecule and it's the stuff it's the thing that does things in cells it's responsible for doing stuff so it makes up the structure of cells and controls their function there should be an s on there controls their function uh, so that's what a gene does so basically what dna does is it codes for genes and a section of DNA that codes for a protein that makes a protein is called a gene. The way that I think about this is think about DNA as like a language. It's like letters of the alphabet, like in English, your ABCs. Okay. And then if I actually write out a recipe in English, then that's like my gene. Okay. My gene is a recipe for making a protein, just like a recipe in a cookbook is for making cookies, for example. Okay, so the gene is a recipe for making a protein. So if I take a look at DNA, here's my DNA, and that's both the molecule and it's like the language it's written in. And then if I take a portion of the DNA that codes for making a protein, then that's called a gene. Now, a lot of DNA is just gobbledygook. It actually doesn't do anything. A um, ton of DNA is just kind of nothingness, but some of DNA, much of DNA is genes and those genes are what make you who you are, okay? That's basically uh, what codes for proteins in your body that end up doing stuff and giving you characteristics and has to do with the passing on of your traits to offspring and so on. Now, packets of DNA are all packaged together in what, what's called a chromosome. We have 46 chromosomes, okay? So humans have 46 chromosomes that are 23 pairs. So essentially I have 23 pairs of chromosomes, which gives me 46 in total because 23 times two is 46. This is kind of like the idea of you have 23 pairs of socks, then that means you have 46 socks. Now one of each pair of chromosomes came from your dad and the other one came from your mom. Okay. So uh, in your 46 chromosomes, 23 of those are from your dad and 23 of those are from your mom. And then they come together to make the 46 pairs of chromosomes that make you, you. Going back to this whole recipe cookbook analogy, if you had a whole set of cookbooks, like let's say, and you know, you probably aren't familiar with this, but let's say companies coming cookbooks, which used to be a really popular uh, kind of like set of cookbooks before the internet was a thing. Um, if you had companies coming cookbooks, right? And you had, a bunch of different cookbooks, that would be like the different chromosomes. And if you had two versions of cookbooks, let's say for desserts, okay, so you had one version of cookbook and then another version of cookbook for desserts. And they contain the same recipes, they contain a recipe for cookie, for apple pie, for rhubarb crisp, blah, 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 but the recipes are slightly different. Okay, so uh, of the two cookbooks you have for desserts, one is a little bit different than the other one. One is from your dad, and one is from your mom. Hopefully that makes some sense. So 
you have DNA, which is the molecule, the language, the code that writes your genetic code. Uh, all together, this is packaged into chromosomes of which you have 46, 23 pairs, okay? And then a section of DNA that makes a protein is called a gene. So you actually have two genes for everything, okay? Uh, you've got one gene that comes from your dad for each trait and one gene that comes from your mom. When gametes are produced, we talked about this a little bit already, through the process of meiosis. You learned about meiosis already. In meiosis, what happens is we get these haploid cells, uh, which means that they have half the genetic code of normal cells. So what happens through the process of meiosis is that each gamete ends up with half the chromosomes, 23 in humans, which means gametes are haploid. Uh, and then when a sperm and an egg comes together, well, now I've got 23 and 23, and then that comes together to make the full 46 that humans have. Now, different um, organisms have different amounts of chromosomes, and the amount of chromosomes doesn't actually have to do with complexity. Okay, there are some chromosomes or some animals and bacteria and stuff that have a crazy number of chromosomes, huge amount of chromosomes, but that doesn't have to do with them being more complex. Cats, for example, have more than humans. I forget what the number is, but they have more than humans. Um, and that doesn't mean that they're more complex, it just means that they're different. Okay, so that is essentially that idea. So if you were to take a look, for example, at sperm or eggs, they would have half the genetic code. So they would have one of the pair of the 23 chromosomes. So they'd have one chromosome one, one chromosome five, one chromosome of the sex chromosomes, okay, uh, which you're going to learn about later on. And then again, when sperm and egg combines and fertilization happens, well, now you have a full set of genetic code. All right, we're going to watch this video from Amoeba Sisters, kind of breaking this down more and giving some information and explaining this better than I could. Finally, let's try out this quiz and see how it goes, uh, trying to figure out what each word means. So, take a moment. We'll probably do this kind of as a, a puzzle as a question thing. Let's start off with a section of DNA that controls characteristics of an organism. And the answer for that is that would be gene. So it makes essentially a protein, right? And controls a characteristic. A base that binds with thymine. So thymine being T. So I have adenine is the other nitrogen base that ends up going with thymine. Strands and bases joined together in a double helix structure. This is DNA. Adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine are all examples of these. These are our nitrogen bases. And then finally, a section of DNA condensed and highly coiled is called a chromosome. So chromosomes, that double helix structure is actually like um, coiled and coiled and coiled over and over and over again to actually make the shape that you saw uh, over, if I back up a bit, Over here, our chromosome, this is DNA coiled and coiled and coiled over and over and over and over again in order to get that structure. All right, well, that's it. That's the uh, altogether DNA genes and chromosomes. So now last thing I wanna do is talk about how all of this relates. And we've actually kind of discussed some of this already, but hopefully um, this will help it make sense. So I wanna go through kind of this cookbook analogy a little bit more. Um, and see if we can kind of make sense of it. So if we take a look at all of our genetic code, then this is split into our 46 chromosomes, right? So you have in all of your cells, except for your gametes, pretty much, 46 chromosomes, and that's 23 pairs. So 23 times two, 23 pairs is 46. Now, on these chromosomes, I have genes, okay? And genes are sections of DNA that give instructions for making proteins.
And then of course I end up getting from this once it actually makes the protein, that's the plan for making the proteins, and then I get proteins being made and the interaction between the proteins and stuff is essentially what ends up making you have the traits that you have. So now, if we were to relate this to kind of the cookbook analogy, our genetic code would be like our cookbook collection. Maybe cookbook is the wrong word. I think recipe book is what I'm looking for here. Recipe book collection. Okay, 46 chromosomes. Well, this means that I have like 46 cookbooks. In other words, I have 23 pairs of cookbooks. So I have two cookbooks for each type of cuisine or baking or whatever. Okay, I've got 23 pairs of them. So I've got like two uh, dessert ones. I've got two... Um, curry ones. I don't know. I'm just coming up with random ideas here. They're slightly different. Okay. Now within these cookbooks, I have recipes. That's like genes. I have recipes and these recipes give instructions for making the food. So at the end of the day, what do I end up getting? I end up getting my food. I get cookies. Yeah. Okay. So the recipe allows me to make the cookies. It's the instructions for making the cookies. Instructions for making cookies. It always comes back to cookies. All right. Hopefully that makes sense. Enjoy the rest of your day.